Hello, this is Professor Janet Smith. I first recorded my talk, Contraception Why Not, in 1993. If you told me then that millions of people would listen to this presentation about contraception and the Catholic Church's teaching on human sexuality, I wouldn't have believed it. I've heard wonderful stories about how the talk has changed people's lives and deepened their faith. It makes me a bit sad, though, that although many people have told me because of my talk, they have welcomed many children into their lives. None of those children have been named Janet. Here we are over 25 years later. The talk has aged better than I have, for the message has only grown more fresh and important as our culture spirals ever more downward into destructive understandings of sexuality. In order to get the message out far and wide, I'm making all my talks available for free. I ask you, my listeners, to reproduce and share this copyrighted work for catechetical and educational purposes. To learn more about how this is to be done, please go to my website, contraceptionwhynot.com. You will find many additional free educational resources there. Thank you. It's, it's really wonderful to be here. I'm actually trying to record a third version of Contraception Why Not. I'm trying every about every five years to do a new one. All right, so this is a new edition of Contraception Why Not, the third edition. My talk has been out there for years, and when it was still on video, one of my godsons, Max, told me that when he misses me, he watches my video. <laughs> he was eight years old at the time, and he said, he said, you know that video of yours, he says, I think it's called uh, Contractions, Why Not? <laughs> right? So that an eight-year-old that's, you know, the oldest of five has never heard of contraception. He can tell you what contractions five minutes apart and three minutes apart mean. And then a couple years later, I went to Trinidad, and I was giving a series of talks in Trinidad, and I was asked about a national problem in Trinidad, and I was asked if I thought rapists should be castrated. And I, I thought, oh, my gosh, I, said, I, I haven't really thought about that issue. I said, obviously, rape's a terrible crime. It deserves a severe penalty, but castration is it's mutilation, it's permanent. I said, I, I've heard there's drugs that can be used to control the sexual desire. Maybe those should be explored. So the next day, I'm buying a newspaper in Trinidad, and the headline says, Castrate Rapists. Uh, subtitle says, Drugs can be used to reduce their sex drive, says U.S. professor. My knees really buckled at that point, and I said, Oh, I sure hope there's some other pro U.S. professor in Trinidad this weekend. <laughs> So I want you to know you can look forward to my three-part series of talks. Contraception, why not? Contractions, why not? Castration, why not? <laughs> Tonight I'm going to go through some of what I want to call the contraceptive myths. We're going to be cracking the contraceptive myths here. Uh, the pill in 2010 uh, celebrated its 50th birthday. It came out in the late 1950s, and people put 1960 as the, the date of the invention of the pill. Before that was largely the condom and the diaphragm. So the pill was something new. It came on the market in 1960s, and really the culture and the world has never been the same since. Right? The changes that have happened since contraception came on the scene are absolutely epic-making. The subtitle here of Time Magazine cover says, So small, so powerful, and so misunderstood. Now I hope I give us a lot of understanding about what the pill and other forms of contraceptives have done. First, let's get a, a notion of what the expectations were that people thought the changes were going to be unbelievably beneficial results. They thought it was going to ensure sexual freedom, that people were going to be able to have sex whenever they wanted to, and everybody was going to be just unbelievably happy. Right? You're going to have access to, to sex when, whenever you wanted to. There were going to be fewer unwed pregnancies. There were going to be fewer abortions. There were going to be better marriages because you could test many partners. You could have many sexual partners before marriage and, and pick out the one you like best, or you could cohabit and test out a relationship so you didn't have to rush into marriage to have sex. And within marriage, you could have sex without the fear of pregnancy, so obviously marriages would be better and stronger and more long-lasting. These are the expectations of what contraception would bring. And then, of course, people thought the world was, was overpopulated, and they thought we were going to be able to control overpopulation by widespread distribution of, of contraception. Now these are the contraceptives, real life consequences, all of which I'm going to at least touch upon tonight. I'm going to demonstrate, I think, that it's been bad for male-female relationships, very bad. It's been bad for the health of women. 
It facilitates sex outside of marriage, which I think is bad for men, women, children, and the culture. It increases the incidence of sexually transmitted diseases. It leads to unwanted pregnancy and single parenthood. It causes and leads to abortion. It contributes to divorce. It contributes to poverty and social chaos. It's harmful to the environment, and it paves the way for same-sex unions. I think all of these things can very legitimately be attributed to, in great part, to the presence and use of contraception. But first, it's a good idea for us to get an idea about how does contraception actually work. Some of you, this might be too much information for some people, but really it's information everybody should have. This is a one slide that shows four different rows that show different things about a woman's menstrual cycle. Women are actually born with all the eggs we're ever going to have. It could be a couple hundred thousand, maybe up to a million or so. And then we have about 30 years of, of reproductive life where every month we ripen and release generally one egg, one egg a month, even though we've got hundreds of thousands. Of course, men are spectacularly more fertile than females. So women are relatively infertile. Men could beget a child any time of the day, any time of the month. But women are only fertile, actually, for 12 hours every month. A woman releases an egg once a month. That egg lives in her body for only 24 hours and can be fertilized for only 12 hours. Now, if you look at the slide here, you've got sort of two surges of hormones. At the top, we have the, the hormones that help a woman ripen and release an egg. And you'll notice it peaks mid-month, a huge shoot up somewhere around day uh, 11, 12, 13, 14. A woman is going to ovulate. If she has a sexual intercourse in the vicinity of the time that she ovulates, she may get pregnant. If she doesn't get pregnant, that egg dies within 24 hours of being released. And so from that mid-month to day 14, you'll notice that the hormones drop suddenly. That means the egg has come and the egg is gone, and a woman cannot get pregnant for the rest of the month. Now you look at there's a second set of hormones on the third row. You'll also notice those peak right about mid-month. And then they stay up and sort of vacillate through the rest of the month. And beneath that row, you see what is actually the endometrium, which is the surface of a woman's uterus. And that endometrium is growing so that when that, a new little human being, a little embryonic human being, travels down the mother's fallopian tube and implants in the endometrium, and that's where the baby will live for the next nine months of its life. And it's attached to its mother through the endometrium. So a woman, at the same time that she's producing these hormones that cause her to ripen and release an egg, that endometrium is getting prepared to be the home for a new little human being. If she gets pregnant, going to travel down and attach to the uterine wall. Again, now if she doesn't get pregnant, she's going to slough off that endometrium. And that's why a woman has a, a period every month that's getting rid of the endometrium from the month before. Now you'll look at this and you'll realize that a woman has virtually a different chemical makeup every day of the month. This should help all of us understand females a whole lot better, right? When a woman every single day has a different chemical makeup than she had the day before. And most of us go through some pretty significant mood changes with these hormones. We're a different person chemically. And most of us, when we get up in the morning, we don't know whether we're the nicest human being on the face of the earth or a real shrew. And usually we don't know until we've talked to some male and somehow that will reveal to us where we are in this cycle. And you wonder about males, the fluctuation of the male sexual hormones that a male experiences, it's a straight line, just like that. If he seems the same today, yesterday, and tomorrow, he is. If she seems like a totally different person from one day to the next, she is. Now this is very important to keep in mind because what the researchers who invented the chemical contraceptives discovered was that they could suppress ovulation and make a woman not able to ovulate by putting into her body synthetic forms of the hormones that she has when she's pregnant. Because when a woman is pregnant, she doesn't ovulate. So a woman who is taking any one of the chemical contraceptives is in a state of pseudo-pregnancy. Her body thinks it's pregnant. She's putting in her body synthetic forms of the hormones that she would have if she were pregnant. Again, they are hormones that are meant to sustain a pregnancy. So she's not having these shifts in her hormones if she's taking the chemical contraceptives, right? Those are flattened out. Now, of course, if she's a healthy adult woman, her body's trying to produce those hormones because that's a healthy condition. 
but we're giving her another set of hormones that are trying to suppress her natural hormones. And there's all sorts of things this has done to a woman's body and actually to her psychology as well. Uh, I happen to be a, a good student of the ancient philosopher Aristotle. And Aristotle always talked about how our senses are designed to perceive the world around us and perceive them accurately. And that God designed our bodies well. We see colors rightly, we hear sounds, we, we have tastes, and if, we, if we're sick, we don't. We might Orange juice that's perfectly fine might taste terribly bitter to us because we're sick. Well, actually, a woman who is taking the chemical contraceptives is actually changing her whole physiology. And she perceives the world differently. And very interestingly, she perceives males very differently. I'll talk about that as we, we go along. Now, this is just a shorthand picture of the same reality. This is a kind of chart that, that is used actually in third world countries to help third world women understand their cycle. It's very good for us. I mean, it's amazing that most adult women don't really know that they're fertile only once a month and get pregnant for only 12 hours of every month. So when I talk about primitive cultures, <laughs> that's us, all right? So what this shows is a chart of a, a woman's cycle. The first couple of days, you'll see the red bars. Those bars suggest, again, that she's bleeding from the month before. The sun above suggests a dryness because at the same time that a woman is releasing and ripening an egg, she's producing a certain kind of mucus that helps carry the sperm to meet the egg. The same hormones that help her ovulate are helping her produce this mucus. For about the first nine days of the month, that mucus is not present. She hasn't ovulated yet. But about day 9, 10, 11 of the month, she starts to produce this fertile mucus. That's why we have a rainy little chart up there. And even though a woman ovulates only once a month, the egg lives for only 24 hours and can be fertilized for only 12 of those 24 hours, this mucus actually helps the sperm stay alive for quite a long period of time. So if a woman had sexual intercourse on Monday, not Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and ovulated on Friday, she could get pregnant from the act of sexual intercourse she had on Monday because the fertile mucus can help the sperm keep alive. There's no egg there. The egg doesn't show up till Friday, but the sperm is being kept alive by the, the mucus until day five. Now, it's very low chance. It's something like 3% chance a woman has of getting pregnant from an act of sexual intercourse she had five days before she ovulated. Even on the day of ovulation, which is the highest chance she has for getting pregnant, because there's more sperm there, there's more of a possibility for her to get pregnant, it's only about 43% chance. So she doesn't even have a 90% chance or 75% chance. She's about, about a 43, 45% chance of getting pregnant on the day she ovulates. Again, shortly after she ovulates, if she doesn't get pregnant, that egg dies. And so we have a third phase of the month, again, where we have that sun, because the mucus has dried up, the egg has died, the different hormones are there. She cannot possibly get pregnant for that period of the month. There is no egg there. There has to be an egg there, there has to be a sperm, and there has to be fertile mucus for a woman to get pregnant. So a woman can learn to tell this presence of this fertile mucus in her system so she can know when she's going to ovulate. She also has her temperature go up when she ovulates, and it stays up for the rest of the month. So if her temperature goes up and stays up for two or three days, she knows she has ovulated, and she knows, again, if she hasn't gotten pregnant, that the rest of the month is absolutely a pregnancy-free zone in her life. There's also a change in the cervix, and there's actually an ovulation monitor that a woman can use to determine when she's pregnant. Very, very reliable. So this is the same information that a woman who's using natural family planning would use in order to determine when she's fertile. It doesn't count days at all. It's not the old rhythm method. The rhythm method counted the days of the month. This is a woman is looking at her own bodily signs. So if she has one month, she has a 21-day cycle. The next month, she has a 33-day cycle. It wouldn't make any difference. She'd still be able to tell where she was in her cycle. Now, this is a information on women between the ages of 15 and 44 who have ever used contraception. 98% of women in the U.S. from ages 15 to 44 have used some type of contraception, 98%. 82% have used the pill, 92% have used the condom, 17% have used Depo-Provera, 21% use female sterilization, 13% use male sterilization, and 2% have used NFP. What's very interesting is that I'm very interested particularly in the courtship phase of women's lives. When they're in between the ages, maybe 15 is a bit earlier, the average age of marriage in the United States is somewhere in the late 20s, around 26 or 27. 
Now, many women are on the pill for about 10 years, between the ages of 19 and, say, 30. Right? They start in high school, and they go until they get married, until they decide to have a child, which for many women is, is after age 30. So for those 10 years of their life, if they're using a contraceptive pill, and there's something about, about 45% of women at that age are using some form of the chemical contraceptives or higher. And that has amazing impact, again, on how they relate to males. So some people said contraception would greatly improve male-female relationships. Well, there's a, a particular book I like called The Decline of Males by an author named Lionel Tiger. Now, my mother told me I should never make fun of people's names, but I find this a little bit irresistible. Lionel Tiger actually studies animal behavior to help explain human behavior. And Lionel Tiger works with a colleague named Robin Fox, another male. And the two of them study animal behavior to explain human behavior. And I've got a whole other talk called Hormones or Us, where I go into more detail with some of this information. But he's an anthropologist, and in the 1960s, when the contraceptive pill came on the market, he said it is going to radically change male-female behavior. Nothing like this has ever appeared in the history of mankind that makes it possible to have sex without the expectation of a pregnancy. And when human beings do that, male-female relationships are going to change radically. So he has this one story about these monkeys. What he did with his colleagues was he put a, a tribe of monkeys on an island to observe their sexual behavior. There was an alpha monkey who they named Austin for some reason, and Austin had picked out three of the female monkeys to be his exclusive sexual partners. Then they gave shots of Depo-Provera to the three females. Austin lost all interest in having sex with those three females and began having sex with the other females of the tribe. Then they gave shots of Depo-Provera to all the females, and all the males stopped having sexual intercourse with the females and started acting in a confused and turbulent fashion. Even some suggestion they were engaging with sexual play with each other. They uncontracepted the females, and the males went back to having sexual intercourse with the females. Now, what many studies have shown is that males are much more attracted to women who are having fertile cycles than women who are not. Males produce much more testosterone when they're around females who are having fertile cycles. Males like that sensation, right? They like being around women who are fertile. This is an amazing thing, that all these women are contracepting during the period of their life when they're trying to attract a spouse, and they're taking contraceptives that make males not interested in them. And I think that's really part of the women dress so immodestly, because they're trying to find some other way to attract men than by their natural hormones that will naturally attract males. This is good news for some of us, maybe even most of it, the magic of sexual attraction. They say female chemical messengers known as pheromones may help dupe men into thinking plain women are more attractive and beautiful women are less attractive than they actually are. Pheromones, the colorless, odorless chemical signals given off by the body, are thought to affect behavior in both animals and humans at a subconscious level. It's kind of similar kind of study here. What they did here is they took a, a group of supermodels and showed them to a bunch of human males, and they had the males rate them for their attractiveness. And, of course, they found these females very attractive. Then they took pictures of ordinary females and showed the men the pictures of the ordinary females, but put something in the room that was soaked with female fertile hormones which men perceive through the olfactory nerves. It doesn't really have a smell. You couldn't detect it, but you're receiving it through your olfactory nerves. And the males found the ordinary women more attractive than the supermodels. So ladies, ladies, what might we want to conclude from this, All right, that the millions of dollars that we're spending on makeup and clothes and everything were undercutting by using contraceptives? And I remember teaching at the University of Dallas, and I, there was a very distinct <laughs> group of females, so different groups of females. It was a good Catholic school, so we had a lot of good Catholic kids who were being chased, and the, some of the women dressed very femininely. I knew they weren't sexually active. They weren't taking the contraceptive pill, and they were truly male magnets, all right? The males just loved to cluster around these girls and talk to them. Again, they felt very masculine. They found the girls very attractive. And then I would see some young woman very immodestly clad, and I knew not to be living such an upright life, and she'd be walking down the quad, again, immodestly clad. And, and the good guys would barely look. I mean, they were sort of like, oh, there's trouble there. <laughs> Don't need that. 
And of course, the guys that weren't so upright were enjoying themselves. So women have a very different effect on men for both their hormones and obviously their way of dress. Now, this one's a very interesting, the t-shirt test. This involved one group of females that were contracepting and another group of females who were not contracepting. Then it featured a group of males who were wearing a t-shirt for the day. And they, well, first, let me say, they rated these males for their evolutionary desirability. On the top of the heap were the men who were healthy and, I suppose, responsible. Women are very attracted, very attracted to men but on the basis of smell. Women think men smell wonderful, except for their sweat socks that haven't been washed. But other than that, think men smell pretty darn good. They had these men wear T-shirts for a day. And at the end of the day, the women, not having met the men, smelled the T-shirts. They tried to rate the men for which ones they thought they might like to date, just on the basis of the smell of the T-shirt. The women who are not contracepting chose the men at the top of the evolutionary ladder. The women who are contracepting chose the men at the lower ranges of the evolutionary ladder. Whenever I get this talk, I see a couple of you nodding your heads now. Mothers come up to me and they say, that explains a lot. And I say, what does that explain? And they say, it explains why my daughter's with that loser. All right? <laughs> She's contracepting. And other women will say, that's why my son, who is just a really fine fellow, seems not be able to attract the women because they're all contracepting and they're not perceiving that he's a very fine fellow. (laughs) So there's most amazing ways in which God has made us chemically wired in order to be able to choose good people. And even there are some studies that seem to suggest, even on the basis of fertility, that when all the natural hormones are working, people are drawn to people that they might have a greater compatibility with for procreating. And that sometimes those who, who are contracepting choose badly. Ah, this is interesting. Taking the pill for the past 40 years has put women off masculine men, says this article in Mail Online. Scientists say the hormones in the oral contraceptive suppress a woman's interest in masculine men and make boyish men more attractive. Although the change occurs for just a few days each month, it may have been highly influential since use of the pill began more than 40 years ago. If the theory is right, it could partly explain the shifting in taste from macho 1950s and 1960s stars such as Kirk Douglas and Sean Connery, sorry ladies, to the more wimpy, androgynous stars of today such as Johnny Depp and Russell Brand. Scientists have long known that a woman's taste in men changes over her menstrual cycle. During the few days each month when women are fertile around the time of ovulation, they tend to prefer masculine features and men who are more assertive. So these hormones are, in a sense, really important for us to protect. Now, contraception may kill the libido, a woman's sex drive. This has been known for a long time. This article's in 1905, and they just studies keep coming out. When women on the pill were tested, levels of a chemical which wipes out testosterone were found to be seven times higher than in those who had never taken it. The sexual drive of women is also driven by testosterone. So when women are taking the chemical contraceptives, that suppresses her production of testosterone, which is the source of her sex drive. Most worryingly, even those who were not on the pill but had taken it in the past had levels up to four times higher than those who had never used it. Past studies had suggested taking the pill could dampen a woman's sexual desire, but that if she came off it, her libido would return within a month. Dr. Goldstein, former director of the Institute for Sexual Medicine at Boston University, Massachusetts, said that while his research seemed to suggest the effects could be permanent, more investigations were needed. This woman saying to her her boyfriend, yes, I admit it, I do look at other men, but if it makes you feel any better, I don't find them attractive either. She's on one of the chemical contraceptives. So now you have this curious thing that women are taking the contraceptive pill so they can be with men and attract men, but they're not attracting men because they're taking the contraceptive pill. And they're taking the contraceptive pill so that they can have sex, but they don't want to have sex because they're taking the contraceptive pill. Something strikes me as being illogical (laughs) about this scenario. Some people thought contraception, again, would make for happier marriages. But the fact is that 43% of those marrying today will divorce within 10 years, and most of them around 8 years. That's a sad story. Uh, My parents were married for 62 years before my dad died. And it's a beautiful thing. It just, so far as I can tell, it just gets better. It just gets better. 
And to be able to have someone around in your aging part of your life, your senior years, is really, it's a gorgeous thing uh, to see that, that love and that closeness. And that people are going to miss out on that. And there's nothing, so far as I know, that is sadder than divorce. I've had two sisters who have been divorced, and uh, kids suffer greatly. We all suffer. I suffer from not seeing my nieces and nephews on holidays. They're always off to see their father. All the distress that goes with that. I read an incredibly sad story in Wall Street Journal the other day, and when I've said this to people, I mean, I, I'm not going to watch because I can tell the people that the, the hurt that people feel. But this woman was saying that she's, she's in her 40s, and she says there's one conversation that she has a lot with people who are in old age group. It's like, where were you? when you heard that your parents were getting divorced? And how did it affect you? And she said she was about nine, and she said her world crumbled. It completely fell apart. She said her father, who was her prince, went off with his girlfriend. She thought, I thought I was the center of his life. And now he's gone off. He doesn't care about me anymore, moved across the country. So my mother, she said she was tall, elegant, beautiful, strong, and now I found her you know, not having showered and her hair matted, lying on the family room crying. She said when she was in high school, she started to, to congregate with other kids who were divorced, and they would smoke dope and have sex, and they were just lost, just lost. And then she said she never, ever, ever wanted to get divorced. So she lived together with her boyfriend for about eight years before she got married, married for, I don't know, maybe 10 years less, and got divorced. And she just said, that's not what she wanted, that's not what she planned. But it's just the, the pain, the pain of this article. I just, it, it made me want to weep to think of how many people could tell that story. And my parents, who, they, they're no way perfect, but just my, John and Ann Smith, I mean, that tells the story. John and Ann Smith, just regular, ordinary human beings who just knew that you should stay together, no matter how hard it got. You just should stay together and work at it, and it would get better. And it did, and, and the, the rock that they were for all of us our whole life long was just phenomenal. Mom and Dad were always there. So, divorce rates. Look at this chart. It's an amazing chart. In 1950, you'll see that 10 out of 1,000 married women had been divorced, and that actually dipped in 1960, and then went up 1980 to about 23 women out of 1,000 getting divorced. So it was more than a 100% increase in divorce between 1960 and 1980. And that's generally the line of when contraception got on the market and became available to every woman who wanted one. The arc of the use of contraception and divorce is pretty close to the same. It's an extraordinary thing. And this is, again, a revolution in the history of mankind that never existed before, that the divorce rate more than doubled in a 20-year period. That's unbelievable. Again, what happened? Lots of things happened in that 20 year period. It's not just the pill. I mean, we were very rebellious. We were overturning authority. There was all sorts of things going on during that period. But contraception played a major, major role in that. We'll talk more about how contraception greatly contributes to divorce. Pay attention to this, all right? Interesting studies. This is from the National Center for Health Statistics, a Center for Disease Control. 1995, I haven't seen more recent studies, but it tells a story that a delay in sexual activity leads to greater marital stability. Now, a couple categories I don't like here, but marital stability for these researchers meant any married relationship that lasted five years or longer, right? That's how reduced our expectations are. But if your sexual intercourse has started at the ages of 12 and younger, you have less than a 20% chance of having a marital relationship that lasts for five years or longer. You're sort of doomed. If you don't have sexual intercourse, and again, look at the highest one here, 26 or older, and that's the average age of marriage in the United States. So if you wait until you get married to have sexual intercourse, you have nearly a 70% chance of having a marital relationship that lasts for at least five years or longer. That's a good little piece of information. Same thing with those women who have more non-marital sexual partners are less likely to have stable marriages. And look at this. The woman who has zero sexual partners before she gets married has an 80% chance of having marital stability. Those who get married at virgins have the best predictability of having a long-lasting marriage. And I suspect that would go for some of those who are what we now have secondary virginity. Women who have had sexual intercourse before marriage but realized it was wrong, men too, realized it was wrong and decided they are going to sort of reconstitute themselves and, and live an upright, chaste life. And I'm sure 
no one studies that category, but I'm sure that's a category that has a, has a fairly a good success rate. But if you've had only one sexual partner before you've got married, your chances of having a stable relationship drop to about 50. If you go down to three, you have less than a 40% chance. And the median number of sexual partners that people have in our culture before they get married is three. So that might tell us why the divorce rate is around 50%, 40%, because people have so many sexual partners before marriage. Let me just talk about that for a minute. Why would contraception impact marriage so badly? I think it's because most people are preparing badly for marriage. Right? Most people have sexual intercourse in high school. May or may not love this person. Generally, they're just curious, <laughs> want to have an experience. Right? They go to college. In college, they might have one or two more sexual partners. And it's no big deal. They now have what they call friends with benefits. You, you go to college and you find someone to be your sexual partner. You don't have a romantic relationship because romance is just, it's torture, you know? Today or tomorrow, how are things going? Does he really love me? Are we still together? It's just, you know, it's hard. You don't want all that emotion. So you just have someone with whom you try not to have an emotional relationship, just a physical relationship. Of course, that usually doesn't work. The breakups are still hard and there's usually emotional attachments, but somehow people think this makes sense. Of course, a lot of those relationships begin with, with too much alcohol, drinking, making out, moving to a dark room with a flat surface, and having sex with someone you really, you really barely know. You may continue to do this or find another partner. Then you leave college, and you are again, you find someone, you meet someone, sparks fly, you have sex pretty early on in the relationship, you're going together, you say, well, listen, we're sleeping at one place or the other, why pay rent on two apartments? You decide to move in with each other after a year and a half or so, either break up or you say, gee, it's kind of time to get married. The sex is pretty good. We don't fight that much. Why not get married? I've been contracepting the whole time, had no real serious discussions about a long-lasting relationship, anything that's really important. You slide into marriage. Then a couple, a little, two or three, four years later, one of the others says, I wonder, you know, don't you think it's about time we started our family? The other one might say, yeah, well, sure, I want to have children, but not now. We've got all these debts to pay off, and I want to do this and that. And the other says, well, I was hoping to have three or four children and it better get started. My biological time clock is ticking down. He says, three or four? Who said three or four? I mean, I, you know, I, I thought one or two was going to be plenty. And yeah, so you have this discussion, and one might say, well, you know, I'd sort of like going back to church on Sunday. You're going to have kids. I'd like to raise them in church. Church? I don't remember any discussion of church. You know, I sleep in on Sunday mornings. You know, I play tennis Sunday mornings. Church? Where'd that come from? And before long, you're going like this because you're having conversations which really you should have within the first three weeks of dating somebody, honestly. You want kids, you want to go to church, you want to live in the Midwest, that's non-negotiables, get those non-negotiables out there, right? So that if this person says, I'm not getting married until we have sex before marriage, I'm not having sex before marriage, goodbye. Don't give your heart away until you've learned whether some of these non-negotiables are, are in place. So people slide into marriage, right? And then, again, they'll stop for a short period of time to have a child, and then they'll contracept and stop contracepting for a short period of time to have another child. And then they'll get a sterilization, and then one or the other will have an affair, and they get a divorce. And that's the pattern in our culture over and over and over again. And I want to say a lot of these people have never had an experience of what the church would call natural sex. They've never had an experience of natural sex. And natural sex is sex with someone who you really, really love that you love so much that you're willing to do the wild and crazy thing of making a lifetime commitment to this person. And then you have sex without contraceptives, and there's a possibility of a baby. And that's huge. Oh my gosh, we could make babies together. That's huge. Right? I married you because I like your laugh and your smile and your walk and your values, and I want you to be the father of my children. I want you to be the mother of my children. And your sexual acts say that, and they're just spectacular. I love you so much I want another one of you. And I want to be here for breakfast and dinner and PTA and saving for weddings and growing old together. And that's what my sexual acts mean. They don't just mean I find you attractive and I want to have a short little physical encounter with you. It means I'm giving my whole self to you. Now people remain virgins before marriage and don't contracept. That's what their sexual acts mean. Those who contracept, their sexual acts mean I want to have a short physical pleasure with you. It doesn't mean anything more than that. You can try to make it mean more than that, but that's, that's really all it means. So you can see why contraception 
just absolutely is the fuel that feeds the divorce culture. Couples who use natural family planning almost never divorce. Almost never divorce. Because they're having natural sex. And natural sex is incredibly bonding, all right? It glues you together. Because you're making a statement with every act. I'm doing something with you that I do not believe I should ever do with anybody else except with you, only you. And I'm making a symbol with this that I'm giving my whole self to you, my whole life to you. Those who contracepted, you know, they have sex in high school. They're not giving their whole life. Have sex in college. They're not giving their whole life. So sex has come not to mean much to them. It's just a momentary thing. It's just a handshake. It's no big deal. And so how can you turn it all of a sudden into something that says infinitely more than what you've been programmed to think it means by using contraception? All right. Some people said contraception would reduce unwed pregnancy and abortion. You all know that it hasn't. But, you know, the rest of the culture doesn't. We have a president now who wants to, is making it mandatory that all health care plans pay for contraception, sort of a, a basis of good health care and prevention of unwanted pregnancy. Why can they not see the data that I see? The data is everywhere, right? Contraception leads to unwed pregnancy and abortion. It doesn't reduce unwed pregnancy and abortion. It leads to it. And we're just giving people a poison in their system and making people, the church, etc., pay for it. It's, it. There's an insanity here. Do contraceptives fail? We, I guess just a little bit. The pill for perfect use is 0.3%. Very low chance of getting pregnant if you're using the pill perfectly. Typical use, 8.7%. Women forget to take it. They don't take it at the same time every day. They may take some other medication that interferes with the pill that they're taking, right? So in real life, a woman has a, almost a 9% chance of getting pregnant in any year that she's using the pill. Even sterilization, 0.7%, almost 1% chance of getting pregnant having been sterilized. A condom, everybody loves the condom. It's the holy grail, right? It's going to save the world. Let's drop condoms from the sky in Africa and every other part of the world. You know, let's send truckloads. I mean, the Holy Father is going to be tried for crimes against humanity in some countries because he doesn't want, again, forbidding, <laughs> he's teaching against the use of condoms in third world countries. Crimes against humanity. It has a 17% failure rate for pregnancy, much higher for the spread of the HIV. But everybody, oh, a condom. The Holy Father is a vicious, vicious man because he doesn't promote the distribution of, of condoms. The patch, 8% chance. So these are pretty high failure rates. I mean, I've, I've heard of women who say, that's my condom baby, that's my pill baby, that's my diaphragm baby. They got pregnant using one of the forms of contraception. And now they, they at least had their babies. But of course, a lot of women abort their babies. We now have, again, casual recreational sex. This young man says, nice to meet you. Would you like to have dinner, go to a movie, and then have sex? And she says, sure, why not? As I mentioned, there's, there's no expectation you even know each other's last names now when you have sexual intercourse. People used to think that you shouldn't have sex unless you were in love. You shouldn't have sex unless you were in love. Remember that? Do you remember when sex was called making love? That's a lovely phrase. I say the phrase having sex all the time, which is kind of crude. I love the phrase making love. But that's not what people are doing anymore. They're not making love. They're having sex, right? But at one time, people said, you shouldn't, you shouldn't have sex unless you're in love. You shouldn't have sex unless you're prepared for babies. And you're not prepared for babies until you're married. That's not rocket science. That's, that's just pure common sense. You know, we tell kids you shouldn't drive a car unless you're mature enough to handle a car. You shouldn't be drinking unless you're mature enough to handle it. Well, you're not mature enough to handle sex, really, until you're married. Because you don't have the proper context for welcoming a baby should a baby come. But contraception has made us separate having sex and having babies. They're two entirely different activities in our culture. People don't say, oh, you have sex, I better be ready for babies. No way. Maybe someday I'll have babies. I have a lot of sex. But babies are on the horizon. They just see one <laughs> is inextricably bound up with the other. I've always been puzzled by this phrase, accidental pregnancy. I used to work at a pregnancy help center where girls, young girls would come in and they told me they got pregnant by accident. 
again, I'm a, an excessively logical person, and his left brain just sort of just would, it would almost cramp, you know, when they said they got pregnant by accident. And I was sitting there, and I was biting my tongue, you know, and I want to say, well, I mean, I wanted to say, you know, don't you know that, that actually something's gone right, something's not gone wrong when you get pregnant or through sex? That's what's supposed to happen. You know, if you step on the gas pedal of a car and it goes forward, you don't go, ooh, how did that happen? All right? <laughs> we know the cause and we know the effect. But people now talk about accidental pregnancy. There's no such thing. It actually, again, means something's gone right, not that something's gone wrong. But our culture is so separated, the two, they're surprised. Oh, I got pregnant. I said, well, you were having sex, right? It, it follows. So what is this? Again, people said it was going to reduce the number of unwed pregnancies. Now more than 4 in 10 children are born to unwed mothers. 42% of babies born in the United States are now born to unwed mothers. 42%. That is internal corrosion that cannot be believed, the effects of this. We hear all about these horrible teachers and how horrible they're, they're doing in school. And I said, like, how can you teach a kid that comes from a broken home? I mean, some of them are okay, but I've seen it myself. They cry when they get up in the morning. They have to get up too early to go to daycare, and then dad's not there. You don't see dad, and mom's stressed out because she's got to get you to here before she goes to work, and then she comes home, and it's just stress plus, and who can help you with the homework because mom's all stressed out, and she's fighting with dad on the phone over custody things for the weekend. It's not the true of all divorced families. Some divorced families can manage it, but it's not untypical. It's not untypical. Right? And you think, what is our culture looking like when 42% of the babies are born out of wedlock? 72% of African Americans are born out of wedlock. Having babies out of wedlock is a really bad choice. It's a really bad choice for uh, the impact on your life and the impact on the life of the children. Okay, contraceptives failure again. A little more on this. Of all women using the pill for one year, somewhere around 8% will experience a pregnancy. All women using the pill for one year, 8% will experience a pregnancy. How safe is that? Between 14 and 15% of women who use the condom will become pregnant within a year. A poor cohabiting teenager using the pill has a failure rate of 48%. I mean, teenagers are just as good as taking the pill every day as they are and making their bed and doing their chores and doing their homework. They're just as good as that. And they sometimes they want to buy a CD or you know a download. I mean, how many iTunes? And believe me, if you give it to them free, some of them will sell it. All right. So the chances of helping out these teenagers by dumping more contraceptives at them, I think, is absurd. Get this one. Over 70% of poor cohabiting teenagers using condoms will be pregnant within a year. By contrast, the middle-aged, middle-class married woman has a 6% chance of pregnancy after a year of condom use. So the very people that we might say would be the ones we most want to get contraceptives to are the ones who have an astronomical failure rate with them. So wouldn't it be better to try to give them a little bit of <laughs> education on the goodness of staying virgins until marriage? They'll have a happy marriage, a long-lasting marriage, financial stability, etc. Teens are doing better. Teens are doing better. There are fewer unwed pregnancies occur to teenagers. It's an amazing thing. Under age of 18, only 7.7% of unwed pregnancies happen to kids under 18. This is going down, all right? Teenagers, may I congratulate you? Teenagers are doing something right. And so it, it really does seem that some of these absence-based programs are actually working. Right? You tell kids the truth, they get it. I mean, they're not all idiots. Right? So the biggest predictors of a kid not having sexual intercourse in high school or college is that they're religious. They love God. They love Jesus. They know what Jesus wants of them. And they also have access to the grace that God gives us. That's the surest predictor. The second predictor is if they want to go to college and complete college. And they say, you know, I've seen other people, they really messed up. I want to get through college so I can wait. I used to see these boys at Dallas. They sort of had blinders on. They got these blinders. They got a job to do. They had to get through college. Then they could look up around and notice. <laughs> right? now, now I'm ready, right? Now I'm ready to get married. All right? I can look up. But not, for that while, there's those little blinders on because they're saying, I've got a task to do. I've got, I've got something I've got to achieve. So the U.S. teen birth rate fell to a record low in 2009. Let's have it around for the teens, right? Still, more than 400,000 teen girls give birth each year in the United States. 
teen birth rates have decreased by 37% in the last two decades. Of course, a lot of that has to do with an increase of abortion, right? Though U.S. rates are up to nine times higher than in other developed countries. Shouldn't we be proud of ourselves? Nine times higher of our teens are having babies than in other developed countries. All right. People think contraception, again, will help teens become more responsible. All right. Teens who have had sexual intercourse by age 19 has, has been around 70%. Again, it's declined some, which is good. But these are teens that by the time they get out of high school, they've already had sex. By the time they get out of college, again, it's well into the 80s, if not 90s. Cost of teen childbearing. According to the Center for Disease Control Vital Signs, teen childbearing has a high cost emotionally, physically, and financially for the mother, child, and their community. About half of teen mothers, half of teen mothers do not get a high school diploma before the age of 22. That's just a high school diploma. The chances of them ever getting a college degree is very low. Girls born to teen mothers are almost one-third more likely to become teen mothers themselves. I used to stand outside of an abortion clinic, and these girls would come in, and, and they'd be walking by, and they're, they actually they were going down to Planned Parenthood, which was down the street. And I would, you know, 14, 15 years of age, we'd get to talk, and their mothers were 30. Their grandmothers were 45. It was a generational thing, because they didn't have an adult in their home raising them. When you're raised by a 14-year-old, how many values can you transmit? You don't have them. Children of teen parents are more likely to have low school achievement, drop out of school, and be teen parents themselves. Teen pregnancy and childbirth cost U.S. taxpayers an estimated $9 billion each year, approximately $6 billion in lost tax revenue, and nearly $3 billion in public expenditures. But we're going to be throwing more contraceptives at our teens. That's our solution. All right? Some people think, oh, well, again, everything will be better. People, fewer unwed pregnancies, et cetera, et cetera. Marriage drops the probability of child poverty by 82%. All right? Of the children living in single-parent, female-headed families, 36% are living in poverty. The biggest number of those living in poverty in the United States are women with their single children. That's the biggest group in the United States living in poverty. It's not hard to figure out why that is. It's just darn hard to raise kids and get a job, and you don't have the education. You have to take a lower-end job, and you can't get out of that. Lower-end jobs are great, but they're the ones things you want to generally move out of. But unless you've got some education and some skills, you can't move out of them. Only 6% of children to married two parents' families are living in poverty. All right, 71% of poor families with children are not married. 71% of poor families with children are not married. Non-married white families are seven times more likely to be poor. Only 3% of married families are poor. Only 3% of white families that are married are poor. 21% of non-married families are poor, cohabiting, divorced, single, etc. Non-married black families are five times more likely to be poor. Only 7% of black married families are poor, 7%. 35% of non-married families are explains a lot. Marriage is a great, great thing for children, parents, the culture. People said it would reduce the number of abortions. Fact is that nearly 85% of the women having abortions are unmarried. Many of the others are divorced or separated. That's no mystery. When an unmarried woman gets pregnant, abortion is a huge, huge temptation. When a married woman gets pregnant, even if that pregnancy is very inconvenient, she has a context in which that baby can be accommodated. She's married. Even if she doesn't want to be pregnant, she has a husband and support system to help her. Now, most of us know that contraceptives also act as abortifacients. As I've mentioned, most of the time, contraceptives prevent ovulation by making a woman's body think it's pregnant. It also changes the mucus so that the sperm doesn't, can't get to the egg. So those same hormones that help a woman, again, ovulate and produce mucus are suppressed by the chemical contraceptive. So she doesn't ovulate, she doesn't produce the mucus, she can't get pregnant. But we have to know that, again, as I said, many times a woman might not take the pill the same time every day. She might be taking some other medication that, that interferes with the workings of the hormones and the chemical contraceptives, and her own hormones might kick in. So she might ovulate and she might produce just enough mucus to get pregnant. So women using the pill, the pill has someone a 2 to 10% chance of a breakthrough ovulation. Something like 40 to 50% with Depo-Provera or the, the patch. 
that women are still ovulating even though they're using a contraceptive. Now, they may not get pregnant in the more technical sense. They may conceive. They may conceive, and that's really getting pregnant. Again, the sperm goes up the fallopian tube. The egg comes down the fallopian tube. The sperm and the egg meet. They travel down to the endometrium. But again, those hormones that are helping a woman's system prepare for pregnancy are being suppressed by the chemical hormones. So that nice, rich endometrium that she was meant to be producing so the new little human being could implant is not a nice, rich endometrium because she's been taking chemicals that work against that, right? And so that little human being tries to implant and instead is just sloughed off. And when a woman is taking the pill, Norplant, Depo-Provera, the patch, all these chemical contraceptives, she could be self-aborting a lot. She'll have no idea whether she's conceiving or not conceiving. She has no idea how it's working. This is one of the huge lies. Contraception will improve your sex life. There is an epidemic of sexless marriages in the United States. This is a story that was on the Oprah Winfrey Show. Tom and Deborah are two of the 40 million Americans in sexless marriages. They've been married for 19 years and have two teenage kids, but say their sex and intimacy have been reduced to nothing. We kiss, we hug, Tom says. Deborah says she didn't even realize that she and Tom haven't had sex for years. Wife didn't realize she hadn't had sex for years. Between raising kids and working, she says sex feels like work. It's just one more thing on my to-do list, she says. Sometimes she says she even intentionally falls asleep before Tom gets into bed so that she can avoid having to say no to sex. I'm kind of at the point where I could live the rest of my life and not have it again. So they want to give these women something called pink Viagra, right? Pink Viagra has testosterone in it because women need testosterone for a sex drive. So these women are taking the contraceptive pill to suppress their sexual desire, and then they're going to give them another pill, testosterone, to increase the sexual desire. Now I'm convinced that, again, one of the reasons these couples are having sexless marriages is that most of their sex, if not virtually all, they have two teenagers, but probably most of their sex has been contraceptive sex. And that, again, takes a lot of the excitement out of sex, seriously. Because having the possibility of a baby, again, is a very exciting possibility. It's a very exciting possibility. Again, I give myself to you like I give myself to no other. But if people have been contracepting before marriage, sex doesn't mean much. Again, how when you get married, do you turn it into this huge expression of love when it was just a de- an expression of desire for a short physical encounter before marriage? How do you turn it into something spectacular after marriage? Now, some people say, well, these people are both working and they're tired and that's why they're not having sex. Well, I happen to have an amazing number of friends who have a lot of children, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven children. They homeschool these kids. And I want to tell you, they're tired. They know what fatigue is. But that doesn't seem to impact their sexual lives, right? They're going quite fine, right? They express quite satisfaction. Again, NFP, couple talking about it in the Couple to Couple League newsletter. He says, the biggest surprise when they started using NFP is what started to happen in our marriage after we started using NFP. I started to feel more in sync with Monica. By that, I mean we wanted to have sex around the same time. We also started to enjoy our sex life a lot more. Monica was more responsive, and she was in the mood more often. I found that after using NFP, we were having sex more frequently. In fact, I read a research study that showed that this is common for couples who use NFP. A man is in a household with a woman who's having fertile cycles, right? He's producing more testosterone. She has sexual desires. It's going to go better. So you want to say, I'm waiting for the Time magazine cover that says, have better sex, wait till marriage and to have sex, don't use contraception, right, and go to church, right? <laughs> Those are almost, it's the, it's the guarantee for a much better sex life than other people are having. Again, I've, I've mentioned this before, but this, the, the difference between contraceptive sex and non-contraceptive sex is enormous. We have this one picture of this couple who are dancing, they're very sensuous, but they're anonymous, no faces. And that's basically saying, I want to have sex with you. It means almost nothing. We could make a long list. We shouldn't do it. We shouldn't even begin to do it. We could make a long list of people we'd like to have sex with. Don't do it. But we could. But now start making a list of people you're willing to have children with. Make that list. 
That's an incredibly short list, right? And that's what non-contraceptive sex says. That says, I want you to be the mother or the father of my children. As I said, it means I like your eyes, your smile, your walk, and especially I like your values. I want you to be the father of my children. I want you to be the mother of my children. That's the most important thing for us. And we want to we want to be good parents. And if we want to be good parents, we have to have a spouse that's going to be a good parent. And that's what non-contraceptive sex says to someone. It's, I've chosen you and you unlike any other. I love you like I love no one else. And I'm making this lifetime commitment with you. All right, contraception has serious, and some people say it has no serious health risk. And the myth is that contraception has no serious health risk. Well, of course, first of all, let's say, fertility is a great good. You have all these people on this cartoon protesting BST hormone-treated cows, genetically altered tomatoes, irradiated meat, and this one woman's shouting at a woman who's against the abortion pill, what are you, some kind of nut? Of course, my point is here, a woman's body is a very delicate and vibrant and wonderful ecological system. It works beautifully. So why would we put all these chemicals into a system that works beautifully? We don't want to put it into our food, into our water, into our air supply, but we expect women to do this day after day, month after month, year after year. It doesn't make any sense again. Common side effects, we've talked about quite a few of these, but again, remember, a woman who's using a chemical contraceptive is in a state of pseudo-pregnancy. And many women will tell you when they're pregnant, they have some increased irritability, increased propensity to depression, weight gain, and a reduced sex drive. So these are common side effects. And doctors say, well, that's not a big deal. <laughs> so yeah, I don't mind being irritable and depressed, etc. That's, that's, no, that's just a small thing, right? That's crazy. These are some of the lawsuits. Oh, they're amazing. This is, this is back in 2008. Johnson & Johnson paid $68 million to settle birth control cases on the patch. Johnson Johnson spent at least $68.7 million to settle hundreds of lawsuits filled by women who suffered blood clots, heart attacks, or strokes. And these are largely women between the ages of 17 and 30 who generally don't suffer blood clots, heart attacks, or strokes. But they were having them because of the patch. They had used the company's ortho ever birth control patch. Johnson & Johnson, the world's largest maker of healthcare products, avoided trials through the confidential settlements and hasn't released the financial details to investors. I have talked to doctors who say they, after they prescribed the patch a couple times, they wouldn't do it again for the number of problems that the girls had that were using it. Breast cancer, huge increase in breast cancer because of contraceptive pills. This is the Jessica Dahl study in 2009. The Jessica Dahl study shows a strong connection between the use of oral contraceptives and a particularly aggressive form of breast cancer with a high mortality rate known as triple negative breast cancer, TNBC. The study also found that the connection was highest among women who began using oral contraceptives while they were teenagers. The 2009 Jessica Dahl study appeared in the April 2009 issue of the Cancer Journal, Cancer Epidemiology, Biomarkers, and Prevention. The research showed that women who start using oral contraceptives before the age of 18 multiply their risk of TNBC by 3.7 times. Recent users of oral contraceptives within the last one to five years multiply their risk by 4.2 times. The reason for this is that a woman's breast doesn't really totally mature until she's in her early 20s, right? And if she starts taking the contraceptive pill in her teen years, in a sense, she's arrested the development of her breast because the, especially with, say, one reason abortion, let's do it this way, the reason abortion leads to breast cancer is because, again, when a woman gets pregnant, her breast is working to become a breast that will produce milk. And the, the, the cells of her breast mature. They become very different cells. And they actually become very resistant to breast cancer. I've had some unfortunate friends who have as many as 11 kids, and they've had breast cancer, never used a contraceptive. But that's very, very rare, very, very rare. One of the major contributors to breast cancer is abortion and contraception, and basically for the same reason. Again, these, the, the contraceptives put a woman's body into a state of pseudo-pregnancy. So her breasts sort of start becoming a breastfeeding breast, but don't mature. So she has all these cells in her body that are breast cells that are, are sort of half- triggered for growth, right? A carcinogen comes in, boom, takes over because they haven't matured and they're not resistant. They're ready to grow and they get triggered by the cancer and they grow into to cancer. There's researchers in France 
actuarial insurance adjusters who are saying that the insurance companies are going to go bankrupt in years to come because of the number of women who are having breast cancer because of the abortions that they had. And nobody's paying attention to the data. I wouldn't buy you cigarettes, right? Again, our culture, our country is ready to prepare for, to give women contraceptives. I, why don't they buy people cigarettes? A lot of people like to smoke, right? Makes them calm, gives them a little social time in their life. They like them. Why shouldn't we buy cigarettes for people? Because it makes them sick, gives them cancer. Why are we going to buy contraceptives for women? It makes them sick. It gives them cancer, blood clots, heart attacks, strokes. And we're going to be buying these for women, not to mention sexually transmitted. One out of five Americans has an incurable, incurable sexually transmitted disease. One out of five Americans. That includes 80-year-olds and 1-year-olds. So you know it's much higher for those between 20 and 45. How do you get that? You get that by having sex outside of marriage. Contraception is spreading disease in our culture. It's not stopping it. Overpopulation. Myth is that contraception was going to help with overpopulation. I highly recommend, I think it's about $20, get this DVD called Demographic Winter. And it shows that we have declining population in our culture. Worldwide, birth rates have declined by 50% in the past half century. There are now 59 nations with 44% of the world's population with below replacement rates. A birth rate of 2.1 is needed to replace current populations. Continent-wide, the European birth rate is 1.3. Europe is not reproducing itself. By 2030, Europe is expected to have a shortfall of 20 million workers. Russia is expected to lose one-third of its current population by 2050. I spent a little time in Italy this summer and was fascinated by abandoned village there, an abandoned village there, an abandoned village there. The population of Italy is expected to go down by about 15 million between the year 2000 and the year 2050. If you lose 15 million people, how many towns and villages do you lose? Right? It's an amazing thing. This is the amazing little graphs here if you quickly go through these, but the changes in the population pyramid is what's happening really all over the world now. In 1950, you have a perfect population pyramid. That means that there's lots of babies being born that support the people as they die off. You know, if, if there's 10 million people born in 1960, in 1961, there's a little fewer than 10 million of the, that little group because some of them died off. By the time you go to your 60-year class reunion, there's two of you, you know, because everybody else died off. So, and that's, I mean, that's the way it's supposed to be. A lot of people born and then some people, and the people on the bottom take care of the people on the top, right? So what happened in 2010, which we're right about now, this is Japan, you can see that they don't have very many people on the bottom, 13.2% on the bottom, 16.3% are sort of between the ages of 10 and the age of 60, and now 23% are over 60. The people in the middle, the 63%, are taking care of the 132 and the 231 Then by the year 2050, they're only going to have 8.6% in that little the category coming up, and that's just going to get smaller, right? And you have 39% over 60, and the 50% in the between taking care of the ones on the top and the ones on the bottom. And it's just going to get worse. So this is what is happening, is that worldwide, we have this declining birth rate and an aging population. And this is a bit of incredible news. There's a worldwide war on baby girls. You'll see here in, in countries such as China, there are 120 males born for every 100 females. In nature, there should be 105 males to every 100 females because males are careless and they die off, right? And then it cuts off because it gets pretty even. So anybody who wants to get married can get married. There's 100 and 100, right? Now there's 120 males for 100 females because of abortion, killing off the baby girls. Further bad consequences. I want to talk about chemical sex. Again, the pill, Norplant, the patch, Depo-Provera. What kind of carbon footprint do these leave? I mean, nobody predicted the effect on the environment. But the effect on the environment of contraceptives has got to be huge. We have these incredible deformity in fish. This is a credible study done in Boulder, Colorado. Fish evidently have flexible gender. If you put enough female hormones into a male fish, it will become a female fish. So in the Boulder, Colorado River, 
they did a test of fish that were above stream of a sewage plant and below stream of a sewage plant. And those above stream in the sewage plant had about a 50% male and female. The fish sampling's results on Boulder Creek were also disturbing. Just below the sewage plant outflow pipe, the team collected 101 females, 12 males, and 10 intersex fish. Upstream of the sewage plant outflow, the team found 42 females, 37 males, and zero intersex fish. Fish are changing gender because there's too much estrogen in the water supply. That estrogen comes from contraceptives and from plastics. wonder what they're doing to us. I wonder what they're doing to human beings. This is happening all over the world. There's stories London, Africa, all over the world they have stories of fish that are changing their gender. No one expected gay marriages. But once you say that sex doesn't have to have a procreative purpose, right? That sex is just for pleasure. Why can't anybody have sex with anybody? And I mean anybody. What limits do we have? If sex is just about pleasure, who is going to put any limits on it? Right? Males should be friends with males. Males can love ma another male intensely. Women can love another female intensely. A father can love his daughter intensely. He should. A mother should love her son intensely. But sex should have nothing to do with it. There's only 2% of males who identify as homosexual in our culture. About 1.4 women identify as lesbians. Why is it that the whole culture has decided that it's perfectly natural to be male homosexual or female homosexual? I think it's because everybody's contracepting. And they say, you know, if I'm having sex without any procreative possibilities, and I'm not married, and I don't have it with you, why can't anybody do whatever they want? And I think it's one of the unexpected consequences of what happened when we became a, a contraceptive culture. This is the biggest lie of all. People say that sex is just sex. It's just a powerful physical pleasure. But the fact is, sex is for making love and making babies. That's what it's for. And our culture has forgotten that. They think it's just for having pleasure. God is love. God created the whole universe out of love. He wants everybody to be a lover. And he wants the love between male and female, it's not good that man should be alone, to be procreative, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. What was the first commandment that God gave mankind? What did he tell us to do? What were we going to do in paradise? Right? We didn't have to make our own food. Everything was there. But he said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. That's what man's supposed to do. That's our first job. Everything else is supposed to help us do that job. That's what God said. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. He can't say that to to Joe and Tim, and he can't say it to Sally and Ruth. They can't be fruitful and multiply to fill the earth. Right? But Adam and Eve can. And that's what he told us to do. Humanae Vitae came out in 1968. It taught the church's teaching on contraception. Beautiful document. Everybody should read it. It's not that hard. Everybody should read it. In 1960, only 66% of Catholics did not contracept. By 1995, and actually much earlier, 80% of Catholics were contracepting at any given time. Catholics contracept at the same rate as the rest of the population. Father John told us why. Priests weren't taught in the seminary not to teach against it. Now they're being taught, and things I hope are going to change. Because I think when Catholics, just like teenagers, when they hear the truth, they recognize it, right? They're ready to live by it. Pope Paul VI said in Humanae Vitae that if contraception became common, there would be a general lowering of morality. There would be less respect for women. There would be coercive control by governments over sexuality. And we would start to treat our bodies like machines. Anybody notice these things in the last 40 years? Reasons to condemn contraception. The church says it's a violation of a good woman's physical and psychological health. We've already seen a lot of that. It's an impediment to the total self-giving of spousal love. We've talked a lot about that, actually. We haven't talked so much about it being a rejection of God as the creator of new life. Let's take a look a little bit at this. Impediment to total self-giving. God's plan was that, again, that the day that a woman got the first positive pregnancy test was going to be, darling, we're starting our family, right? Euphoria all around. Babies are bonding. It requires 23 male chromosomes, 23 female chromosomes, 46 chromosomes that make a new human being that would not have existed on the face of the earth unless these two people, we hope, made love. God's a lover, and he wanted every baby born into a relationship that was bonded by love and that welcomed new life. God, out of love, creates 
new life. He made male and female so that out of love, they would make new life. And they would be like God. God is an unconditional lover. And he wanted the spouses to be an unconditional lovers of each other and of their children. This slide's incredibly important. God creates each and every human soul. This is very important. The sperm does not have a human soul. The egg does not have a human soul. When sperm meets egg, where does that soul come from? A sperm is mortal. An egg is mortal. They just have a short, brief life. A human soul is immortal, lives for an eternity. Sperm meets egg. God has to create that new human soul. It's much worth thinking about yourself and really about everybody else that God created the soul of each, every human being individually and said, I want this one to exist, and I want this one to be with me for an eternity. God wants every human being to exist for an eternity. God made your soul individually. It's not like he has a whole warehouse of souls that he's waiting for the next sperm and egg to meet, and it just comes down a conveyor belt and pops in. Documents of the church talk about spouses as being co-creators with God cooperators with God in the creation of a new human life. The male provides the sperm, the female provides the egg, and God provides the soul. And he wants that to be in a loving relationship where that baby is accepted as a gift from God and say, thank you for this gift. We're going to do our best to send this kid towards you. That's what we're going to do. Contraception puts a barrier between the sperm and the egg and God. It's saying, we want to have sex on our terms. You made us fertile just over that short period of the month, but we're going to make sure that period is also infertile because we want to have sex on our terms. Instead of saying, God, if we have sex during that fertile time, we're going to accept any baby that you send us. Now, the church talks about responsible parenting. Right? This is a little old woman who lived in her shoes. She had so many children, she didn't know what to do. God doesn't want people to keel over dead having kids. Right? He wants you to raise the children that you can raise well. Right? It's always demanding. One's incredibly demanding. Two's incredibly demanding. Three, they tells me a little bit easier than one and two. They tell me four's a whole lot easier than one, two, and three. Someone told me after a certain point, five, she said it doesn't matter. They just keep coming and you've reached a, a degree of chaos from which you can't recover. And, um, <laughs> but you don't want them all at once and you want, sometimes you need a breather. All right, you're tired, you're stressed, finances are short. But it, it's not necessarily that it gets all that harder. You know, number three starts entertaining one and two, one and two entertain number three. You know, you get better at parents, you get more organized, and things start happening. And, but there are lots of times when people might have to push the pause button, say not for another year, two years, whenever, Just push the pause button. Church says that's fine, that's fine. Natural family planning works really well. Go ahead and do that. So it works. It works every bit or better than any form of contraception. That's not why it's great. That's not why it's moral, but it's good to know. Pregnancy rates of couples using NFP have depended on the motivation of couples. Increasingly, studies show that rates equivalent to those with other contraceptive methods are readily achieved in the developed and developing worlds. Indeed, a study of 19,843 poor women in India had a pregnancy rate approaching zero. Natural family planning is cheap, efficient, without side effects, and may be particularly acceptable to and efficacious among people in areas of poverty. Nearly 20,000 poor women in India had a pregnancy rate approaching zero using NFP. Do you know who teaches them NFP? Mother Teresa's nuns. One-third were Muslim, one-third were Hindu, and one-third were Christian. Benefits of NFP? No bad physical side effects. If a woman can, takes away at least the irritability that's associated with contraception, irritability, propensity to depression, weight gain, reduced libido, those are not, at least if they're there, they're not the result of the contraception. It requires mutual sacrifice. Not one or the other is having to bear the burden of the contraceptive practice, to make love and to abstain. It enhances communication between spouses and strengthens marriages. That's so strong. I mean, The couples I know that have not had sex before marriage, they find using NFP quite doable, all right? Quite easy, actually. Because if they've been dating for a year year and a half, two years before marriage, believe me, they have wanted to have sex. And they have had opportunities to have sex. And they have decided not to have sex. 
and they have learned how to be in each other's company and enjoy each other. A year and a half, two years of courtship, loved each other, loved being, which couldn't wait to see each other, couldn't wait to do these things, shopping, whatever it was, it was fine. You were with that person. It was great. You're in love. Right? You've got a greater toolkit of love-making tools, you want to say. It was make love to make dinner with each other. You make love when you go to a movie. You make love when you have a walk. You're loving this person. It's not just sex. Whereas the couples use contraception, it's like sex is really, you take it out, and they just don't, sort of like, how do we show our love? How do we interact? How do we even be affectionate? Because doesn't affection always lead to sex? The couple, year and a half, two years, they didn't have sex before marriage. They have all sorts of affection that doesn't lead to sex. They did it for a year and a half or two years. They can do it. Couples who have contraceptive, it takes them about a year and a half to learn how to enjoy NFP. And then they do enjoy it. They say something's come into our marriage that wasn't there before. Great mutual respect. Uh, great respect for fertility. Great sense of cooperating with God. We're doing it God's way and not our way. That's always better. Right? Strength is a couple's relationship with God. There's one thing. You want a little mantra in life that once helps me. God's will is better than my will. I'm sure of that. Of all the things that I'm sure of in this world, I know that God's will is better than my will. And I know that when I think, God, I really want this, I, you should do it my way, I really know what I should be saying is, God, whatever you want, because you're, you're better at this, everything than I am. So really change my will. If there's a conflict between us, don't you change, change me. Right? God's will is better. And a couple using NFP, generally, they love God. They love God. Gave me this woman, gave me this man, gave me the sex, gave me this baby. God, you did a great thing. Very, very grateful. And no harm to society. And couples using NFP almost never divorce. And can you imagine if we had a culture where people didn't divorce? Waited until marriage to have sex and didn't divorce. Do you think anything would be different? It would almost be that everything would be different. Everything would be different. Schools would be safe. Entertainment world would be more sensible. We have married people writing these things, right? protective of children, everything would be better. Again, my recommendation is, you want to say, well, some people call me and say, well, you talk to my sister-in-law. <laughs> I say, well, that's why I did a CD, so you could give it to your sister-in-law. All right, so get a couple CDs and just put them in your car, in your teenager's bedroom. And for, for Mother's Day, ask your daughter to listen to this or your son to listen to it. For Father's Day, say, I don't want anything for Father's Day. Just listen to the CD and talk to me, right? Because it can make a big difference in people's lives. And I appreciate your being here. I think that our culture needs the church's wisdom on this profoundly. I think, again, if I could wave a magic wand and change everything, first I'd have everybody do Eucharistic adoration. That would be number one. The whole world doing Eucharistic adoration. That would change everything. Second would be not contracepting. Because I think that would lead to people not fornicating, not getting divorced, not getting abortions, and we'd be spectacularly better. Thank you very much.